so here we are. My name is Steve Gravestock. I'm a senior programmer at the Toronto International Film Festival, and we're here with the uh, the talent behind uh, Middleman, uh, which you just saw. So um, I think this is the biggest Zoom group I've ever worked with, or it's not Zoom, sorry, it's a different platform, but uh, uh, the biggest uh, online thing I've done. And anyway, here, here we have uh, director and writer Ben Hamer, and uh, we can all hear the digital applause, I'm sure. And the stars of the film, uh, Ron McKellar, uh, Ken Welsh, Paul Gross, Sheila McCarthy, Nina anderson Barood, and Tuva Navani. Uh, so welcome, guys. Uh, I understand this, uh, you, this might be the first time some of you have actually met. Uh, is that the case? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it? Uh, yeah. So we'll make it homie uh I forget, I forget if i've ever met paul before no. <laughs> i think i have yeah yeah okay uh well paul's a mysterious figure uh <laughs> so do you guys uh, ben if you could talk a bit about how the uh the film came together and how you got well i mean how you know i understand it was based on a novel uh the novel seems very close to your sensibility i thought like it was almost like a ben hamer script uh uh, from that said, do you want to talk about what attracted you to the book and, and how you adapted it? Yeah, sometimes you say that uh, either you adapt the book you really don't like, but you only see the potential, or you do the opposite, which might be a little bit more dangerous, and you go for something you really like and feel connected to. And it's the, that was the case with this uh, uh, adaption, I would say. Uh, it's uh, one part out of three in in the same novel, but it's uh, what to say. It's uh, it's a uh, beginning and an end, so it's uh, it, it's right there to dive into this uh, what to say Midwest small town and try to uh, yeah it's adapt the soul of the story, which is quite universal, I would say, but very easy to spot, uh, especially geographically, because you have this small town and you have a lot of small towns in the Midwest struggling with the same uh, thing, with the no belief in the future and all the industry, everything is gone in a way. Uh, so for me, I didn't start looking at places in Toronto. I started in the US. But it was very hard to, yeah, to finance it and to pull it off in all senses. And we even uh, was looking around in Romania. Could we shoot it in the back lot of a studio? We went to Ireland, and I even uh, uh, tried to figure out if it was possible to do it in Norway. But I, I mean, it would be quite uh, different to try to to change it into a Norwegian society. Then I think you have really to go into a yeah, non-existing place or what to say. Yeah. Uh, and then finally we uh, found uh, uh, Simon Udel at, uh, and Jennifer Weiss at uh, uh, the, the film farm. And uh, they read the script, and they, uh, I think they said at the same time, oh, it's Sue St. Marie. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I had to <laughs> go over. We went up to Sue St. Marie, and I was very happy about what I saw and saw the possibilities, of course, uh, there. And uh, yeah, that was basically how it, it happened. And of course, also the support from all the fans in. Canada was uh, yeah, vital to, to make it happen. Absolutely. I, it, I have to say, it's a very, uh, Sault Ste. Marie looks sort of eerie and otherworldly at points. Like, you know, obviously it's a town that's losing its industry, but the look of the film is quite sensational, I thought. Uh, do you want to talk about how you guys constructed that? or Because it doesn't look like what I, I've seen Sault Ste. Marie in person and in, film and it doesn't look like any version of Sault Ste. Marie I've seen. 
No, I think maybe that's it's. Yeah, it's nice to say that. If not, I think we would have some um, people up in Sault Ste. Marie who uh, won't welcome us anymore. But uh, no, but you have, it's, I mean, we was looking for these down and out places and even tried to uh, uh, yeah, make it more down and out. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's not 100% uh, what's the presentation of Sault Ste. Marie, of course. Yeah, but yeah. it's the kind of what they say, what we, what we lo was looking for. Uh, um, yeah, the, this kind of down and out places you can find it all over the Midwest, and even more than we showed also. But uh, yeah, it was possible to to uh, to uh, yeah to what they say to pretend that it was uh, one one town looking like this and we also shot quite a few scenes one third of the film in germany basically uh, interiors but still we have to match it also so i mean it's in a way all about lying but lying in the right way so uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's part of the truth as well cool uh yeah. maybe maybe you guys can uh, uh talk about what attracted you to the script or your Maybe Don, if you want to start. Uh, okay. Well, I mean, I feel I, I read it and right away felt it had a very strong, clear sensibility. And then I looked at Ben's films, and uh, I that's what I that's what the sensibility was. And I feel that in a way that's what attracted me first. I just thought this is a film that has a voice, knows what it wants to say, and that seems rare to me these days so that was the main thing that attracted me Ben, and uh not oddly enough the part it's spectacular as it is i i, I but i just felt and then the, i felt the story was very compelling at the time especially it felt very very um timely this sort of uh forgotten uh desperate america uh that was oppressed and faced with a kind of inexplicable tragedy in their eyes at least ken ken no one has yes. even mentioned ken's condition let's see if it comes up in his conversation uh what were you going to say there Tom? <laughs> uh yeah no i thought it was a fabulous script because it wasn't ordinary at all you know it, there's nothing like boringly naturalistic about the, the writing of it, the story uh, and the characters. I found that, you know, the dialogue, the way it was written, very kind of appealing and natural and attractive. And, uh, and then, of course, I met Bent and I was totally sold on doing it. So, uh, you know, we had this little chat over a coffee and uh, I told him was, I was too old and he kind of agreed, but we went ahead anyway. That's about <laughs> it. I have nothing more to say. <laughs> so, I think my conversation, by the way, that I was too young. I think in the script he's like in his seventies. So, uh, so we there had a conversation. <laughs> too late, too late to trade now. That's all right, though. Paul, Paul, I think you have the, one of the best lines in the in the in the script. Actually, the uh, the the moment where you turn to Frank Frelli, the the main character, and you say you only you only get one chance to say as little as possible. <laughs> which I think it should be a programmer's mantra. Uh, <laughs> hey, Al? I, I, uh, I think I, I read it and I thought I have absolutely no idea what this is about or how it should work or how it should feel. And then I had lunch with Bent and I thought, well, I still have no idea what I would do, so I better do it. <laughs> and I, and it, was, it was fantastic fun to work on. It was in a way I felt like I kind of started to only slowly understand it as we kept shooting. Because I really had no, and it was great too. I think that we all kind of experienced this as actors. You'd get up, you'd do something and then he would come over and say, no, no, don't do that. <laughs> and then slowly you kind of understood what he was after. And then I think it made sense. <laughs> Sheila? Oh, I think we're. I am. Yeah. Um, 
I, I, I felt the same way that you did, Paul. I thought I was coming in to play this, the grieving mother and that it would be this these big sort of, you know, sort of um, volcanic scenes. And it was none of that. And so I really felt that it was a coming in to do very little. And yet when I watched it, it the, the puzzle piece fit in with the, with the opaqueness and the kind of grief that you were outlining in the movie and the landscape of Sault Ste. Marie. So I had one vision in mind and it was an entirely different experience. And who doesn't want to go to Sault Ste. Marie? So there you go. It was a beautiful experience. Cool. Nina? Oh, well, I have to say uh, a lightning bolt goes through me if there's ever a chance to partake in a Ben Towner film. Uh, he just has a, he's just got a, a special love for uh, ordinary people and, and knowing how to find the exotic in them. And uh, so, and, and being on set with him, it, it's such a sort of warm and in inclusive experience. And I, you know, and then, and then being able to, to come back to Canada. I mean, uh, I live in Norway um, and have done so since, well, roughly since 1986. So being able to come back to Canada was an amazing opportunity. And then, and the way he puts things together, I mean, I can feel myself getting a little bit emotional while I'm talking about it because uh, I haven't seen the, the completed film yet. Um, I'm waiting for, I'm waiting for the big uh, premiere reveal. <laughs> and, uh, but if I'm just to sort of recall the, the, the feelings when I was reading the script and, and, and seeing the, the relationship between uh, the mother and, and the protagonist, there were, were so many, so many, so many elements that that were, uh, I know, just just covered in a in a in a sense of warmth that uh, that bent. It, I feel uh, for me personally has been a unique experience uh, every time I work with him. So, yeah, the, for me it was the uh, the his love of down to earth people and and making what they go through something exotic and and uh, beautiful under the magnifying glass. Tuva? Oh, yeah, well, I, I, you know, I'm just summing up what everyone else said, I think. I, I also didn't understand the script, but I knew I wanted to work with Bent for a long time, for many years. We've been talking about it. And so, you know, for me, I think when you feel secure about having made the choice of doing something or not, then it's like a roller coaster. So I just kind of went along and it was a very nice ride. I still don't really know what it is, <laughs> but it's. I think it's beautiful, and I think it was a great ride, and I'd love to to do that again. But yeah. And uh, I, I, I love the. the uh, well, I was gonna. It's also the. Uh, I mean, I love that scene at the end where. Oh, I love the flirtation between uh, the sort of odd on again, off again, awkward flirtation between you, your your character and uh, and and the and the main character Frank, but the. Uh, and and the boat ride at the end, which is like awesome. Do <laughs> uh, you want to talk about how you guys did that? Because it's like a it's a great sort of uh, it really is sort of central to how things develop in the film. Because one of the things I think that's great about the movie is the um, is that no one admits no one wants to talk about the central fact, and it, it's raised I think once in the uh, uh, like once or twice in the script where it's like, why does this town have so many accidents and why are so many people passing away in strange circumstances? And that's sort of, the, that's sort of how the whole film develops is no one really addresses the obvious yeah. question. It's, uh, and I think that's part of how we're, they're grieving about things as well. So it, it's sort of, you know, kind of beautifully displaced and it makes it much more plaintive. But anyway, go ahead. Well, even shooting it, we didn't really know what the answer was. I mean, I remember talking to you, Bent, and I was like, so is this for real? Or, you know, what, what is this? Is it, or is it just a dream? Or is it, are we on a philosophical level? And I, I don't really think I got a straight answer from Bent, you know, and, and I love that because to me, that's, you know, the, the best kind of way to present the movie to an audience to, to give them space to interpret themselves, you know? So I don't know what the ending is, but maybe Bent knows. I'd love to hear what you say, Bent if it's different now than when we shot it. But then I didn't get any answers. <laughs> well, I haven't seen the film now for one and a half years. <laughs> so I don't know. I, I tell you when I've seen it again. No, it was quite strange, the ending, because even in the at the script stage, the Germans, uh, they 
most of the Germans who read it, they thought uh, this is a kind of dream. It's not the reality playing in the film. While most of the other people who read it uh, thought it's it's the what to say the, the reality of the uh, what's happening in the film. Uh, and when you ask me, I would say both options are quite good. And maybe I can tell you what I feel in a way, but it what it has it doesn't matter in a way. It's up to each and one of the the audiences. I love that answer, Brent. Yeah, I, yeah. But I, I I don't have. Uh, I mean, it's uh, I can't say it's it is like this or it is like that. It's an open ending in a way, but obviously, it's, Karmak is a place with all this uh, death and so on and. As you said, Steve, with the uh, obvious question missing, uh, why? But I think that in my head, it has always been like all uh, karma is not very special. It's it is like this in a bunch of towns in the Midwest, but you also have the same kind of problems throughout Europe and in other places where you have, like in Spain, you have 40, 45 percent unemployed people among the young people up to 40 years old. They live with their parents. So this is not just a uh, North American problem. It's uh, it's a worldwide problem. And I think Lars Sobekis wrote the, uh, the novel. He was a little bit ahead always all the time in a way. I agree. I grew up in the Swedish countryside and it's just like that. So for me, it's not an American specific story. You know, it's a, it's a very universal for me, to be honest. I'm being mute myself. Absolutely. But it's maybe easier to point it out. And for us, it's a little bit exotic also, of course, uh, want to do a kind of Western. Uh, but the geographical, what to say, uh, limitations in a way it's not the common spiel which i've been done before but it's, it's a kind of common spiel in a, in a town that you it's hard to stay there but it's even harder to to get away um, but it doesn't mean that it's only karma and in that town it's uh, something that concerns a lot of towns and a lot of people i think yeah, I, I, I can't I, answer I, the question. <laughs> I do it when I meet you. Well, one time I can say what I think, but uh, it, it doesn't matter <laughs> too much. Uh, to me, it sort of brings. Uh, it, it, I've I always thought that sort of times that were sort of dying, like or you know, kind of on their, you know, a short uh, lifespan or a shortened lifespan uh or like ghost towns that they're actually not haunted by the dead they're haunted by the living who refuse to leave uh which i think is sort of percolating through the whole uh, the film is that people insist on staying even though there's less and less reason to stay uh did anybody want to comment on that anyone yeah, but it's easier for you to speak about it, obviously, than the director. Thanks, Steve. Uh, <laughs> well, that was well put, I thought. Oh. Uh, okay. Uh, I think, I mean, um, go ahead. No, I, I was just going to say, it just harkens to that saying, better the devil you know. I mean, people, you know, it's so much so much more frightening to, uh, to embark upon something new and, and unknown uh, and sort of most people um would prefer to die being unhappy uh but in uh, well-known surroundings than necessarily taking that step out into the unknown and maybe achieving their wildest dreams um i'm not an, ex an expert but uh but that's what it makes me think about yeah i'm just unsure whether they are embarking on a trip or if they're actually just committing suicide that's my problem i don't i don't know if that's the adventure or the, the adventure is actually trying to make a life back where they came from i'm like hmm i don't know it's a lot of option exactly yeah yeah that is quite mysterious at the end because i didn't think any of those yeah the, uh, didn't strike me that there was a motor in that boat <laughs> or <laughs> <you know. laughs> Did we have sails even? I can't remember. I yeah, I, I thought, I think that it was sort of, that, I mean, that whole boat graveyard thing was 
quite uh, quite surreal, yet you know it's it's very almost naturalistic. Uh, all the drift, the boats that drift downstream, and all that. Um, okay, uh, d uh, I, the uh, I just um, Bent. I guess I should ask. Uh, you know, you have a very um, uh, specific uh, uh, comic sensibility. Um, uh, did you find did that jive with the Canadians you were working with, or the Canadian? Uh, sort of sense of humor uh because i i feel that it kind of well i mean we've shown a lot of your films here at tiff and uh uh it usually does so uh how did you guys do you want to talk about Ben's sense of humor and the, and that kind of almost absurdist uh 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 sort of deadpan uh comic style that he that he has or maybe don you you always I always, I, 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 both Don and Paul, I thought, I, I, I never saw you guys as small town, like bureaucrats in a, in a commission in a small town, but you, uh, you, you took the leap. Uh, anyway, go ahead. I didn't think, I didn't think any of it was funny. <laughs> uh, we were very serious about our jobs, Don and I. Totally. And the job with mission. And yeah, that's not funny. They were important jobs. They are deadly serious however there is this sort of nordic <laughs> humor that i do feel canadians have uh, have always been able to identify at least i have always been able to identify with mm -hmm. a lot of scandinavian films and cold a lot of serial yeah i thought you guys were so funny and i kind of had a halfway realization i'm like oh my god this is comedy they're doing <laughs> And here I am with the Scandinavian noir. I'm like, oh God, I'm flashing just by thinking about it. But I thought you, you had a great sense there, great tone. I just didn't get it myself. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you did. Yes, you did. <laughs> you're very funny. It was great. But I think okay. the, the, I mean, as you said, Steve, you call it dead pan, and that's okay in a way, and not to be, try to be pretentious, but. I think this kind of Scandinavian, if you can put it that way or define it as a Scandinavian kind of humor from the above the vodka belt uh, is maybe more kind of poetic humor. I like to use that expression. That's great. I know it can, it seems a little bit pretentious, but it also gives uh, the actors, the possibility to put in whatever they think is funny. And I talked, we talked a, a lot about it, Paul, not a lot, because we, we, we were on the same page that we shouldn't try to be funny at all. And I don't think I've tried to be funny in any of my movies, even if they try to sell this at, as comedies. There are hum humor in, in the films, but I, I never tried to be uh, funny or made funny films. I, I can laugh, of course, too, but it's uh, I, I'm not trying to make uh, comic scenes to make sure. them. Uh, uh, yeah, so I, as I used to say, when I make a comedy, I will I will announce it uh, clearly. <laughs> Thank you, Brent. Then I'll know to next time. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it, it won't happen. <laughs> so. Yes, yeah, somehow I feel that, like I think Tuva said, that there's something very humane about these characters. That some, it's some, it's sometimes it's hard not to be, to find eccentricities in regular people without seeming condescending. But I, right, right away when I read the script, I thought there's a genuine, uh, he's been able to identify it and actually even has, has affection for these characters. Uh, so yeah, it isn't just comic, comic uh, writing. It's oh, sort sure. of, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. You, you know, Don, uh, I, I, Paul, when you came up to Susan Marie, I, you, you came as uh, as the doctor. The, you came as the just like the character. Uh, in a way, and I, I thought uh, uh, Don is like that. You are like that, but people thought, no, no, it, he's just playing out his character. I, it took a long time before I understood it. <laughs> I hope I'm not. I hope I'm not. 
<laughs> no, but which is, uh, I would say it's, uh, yeah, it's a positive way of <laughs> uh, seeing you.